So let's talk briefly about the regulation of token sales. This is a big and confusing topic, so this will not be an in-depth talk, but it should help you understand the issues at play. The first thing to realize is, at least with respect to securities regulation of tokens, securities laws can apply very broadly. Not all sales of securities are sales of, say, a share of Apple stock. Several things among here Uh, chinchilla, beaver, gold bars, worms have been sold under certain conditions and in certain situations wherein they've qualified as sales of an investment contract or a security. And the SEC has this flexible test to determine when something fits its definition for investment contract. And now we have tokens, and there's all sorts of tokens, and they're sold, or even not sold, sometimes they come through mining, but they're, they're out there in the world in different economic realities, in different circumstances. And in some cases, those circumstances may also fit the test for an investment contract, and in some situations, I believe it will not. What it boils down to, this test for when it fits or when it doesn't, is two questions. First, Is the thing being sold as an investment contract? And the second, is there a person upon whom investors are relying? And you have to answer yes to both of these for it to be a security. The second one goes basically like this, because gold is, of course, an investment. People buy gold. But there's no person that someone buying gold really relies upon to make gold valuable. Gold is valuable because of a network of people in the world people mining it out of the ground, people finding uses for it, like scientific uses or jewelry, and of course, all of the people trading it on markets. That's where the value comes from. If you buy a share of Apple stock, the value really is reliant on a person. It's Tim Cook, of course, and the rest of his management team. And so when we look at tokens, we can use these two aspects of the flexible test for securities to just understand what's going on. The first question we might do to classify different types of tokens is, why is the token desirable? Is it desirable because it provides some use value, or is it desirable because it provides investment value? And then the second question is, okay, what's backing up that value? Is it a network, more like gold, or is it an issuer, more like Tim Cook? So by this first question, just to be really clear, I'm saying, let's treat the sale or the scheme or the thing we're looking at as a black box. And if it's an investment, we'd expect money goes in and out comes more money. But if it's something useful, what do I mean? I mean money goes into the black box and out comes some sort of service or good, some commercial thing. That could be 200 gigabytes of cloud storage. It could be 4 billion computing cycles to render uh, special effects in a, in a movie. It could be concert tickets um, to a venue or some event. Or it could be that the money you put in doesn't change into anything, it's still money, but it goes to somebody else, it goes to Bob. It's still money, but that's a service, that's a useful utility, money transmission itself. And then to clarify this issuer versus network distinction that we're talking about, let's change the black box into something we understand, like, for example, PayPal. When you put money into PayPal, What does PayPal do? They provide a service. They help you transmit the money to other people who are using PayPal. So you can send money to Bob. Now, what is going on inside of PayPal? Well, a few different things. Uh, They do user onboarding and authentication. So they give you a username and, and you set up a password and they make sure that only people who can fill in the correct password can start money transfers. Um, So they're doing that authentication role. They keep a record of who's sent money to who. That's really most of what PayPal does. Uh, And that's important because let's say I have $50 in my PayPal account and I send $50 to Bob. They need to know that I now have zero so that I can't try and send another $50 out of thin air to Alice. And then finally, there's this management oversight role that people within PayPal's company play. These are the people who look over the other functions, make sure that we are checking passwords well, make sure that the records are being kept well, that the business is functioning like it's supposed to. It's oversight. How would we build PayPal as a network instead of a centralized company? Well, we'd have to automate some things and change the rules of the game. First, instead of a company, there's a series of computers. 
Um, these are computers run by strangers over the internet. And we network them together using the internet on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And then we take some of these functions like authentication and we turn them into simple mathematical functions. So instead of using some sort of, you know, database of passwords and usernames and checking one against the other when people sign in, we use public key cryptography. And the reason why we use this um, mathematical construct, public key cryptography, is this way every participant in the network can independently verify the integrity of the math. So if I say I have these five bitcoins, say, and I want to send them to somebody else, I sign a message saying I want to send them, and I sign it with my private key. Every computer in the network can check that that private key matches the public key, can validate basically my authorization to send that Bitcoin. So everybody performs that function. Everybody also performs the record keeping function. So you've got all these computers. Every single one of them is keeping a copy of the blockchain. Every member of the network is independently keeping a copy of the record and only validly signed transactions get added to that record. And finally, there's this question of management or oversight. So if it's just a network of equals connecting to other equals and there's no hierarchy, then there can't be management, right? So how do we make sure that the blockchain record keeping function and the public key authentication function are being performed well without oversight? Well, the protocol, the software that all the computers are running, automatically rewards individual participants based on the amount of work they do securing the blockchain and putting only valid transactions into that blockchain. So if you contribute more work, you get Bitcoins out. And this creates incentives that make everyone in the network want to do those two functions well and automatically punish members of the network who aren't doing those two functions well. That's how you can have PayPal without any corporate oversight, without any management in the middle controlling all the participants in the system. And this is radical. This is Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies. Uh, but it actually works. You can put money in to the system and then send it to anybody else who's connected to the Bitcoin network. Now, just to take another example, what if we put Amazon here instead of PayPal? And I don't mean Amazon's department store you know, selling products business, I mean their cloud storage business, something they actually do really, really well. They are by far the dominant provider of cloud storage on the internet. So how does this work? Well, they're not a black box anymore. You put money into Amazon and Amazon gives you, say, 200 gigabytes of cloud storage. How would we do that as a network instead of a centralized company? Well, What's going on here? Again, they're checking passwords because we want to make sure that only the right person can open the files that they stored. Strangers can't open their files. They do record keeping to, you know, keep track of whose files are stored where and whose files belong to who. They do data center maintenance. This is the, the addition here to PayPal. They have these rooms full of hard drives that actually physically store the data. And then there's the management oversight role again, the people within Amazon's uh, corporate structure that make sure that the other three functions here are performed well. How do we turn this into a network? Well, again, we'll have computers on the internet that are connected through the internet, TCP IP and peer-to-peer -peer protocols. And then we'll have everybody perform the mathematical functions necessary to you know, basically check passwords to make sure that only the right people are able to access the right files. We'll keep a blockchain record on every connected participant to note whose files are stored on which uh, hard drives and who's paid for storage, who's sold storage on the network. And then instead of having one company maintain the data center, every computer that comes and joins the network can, if they want to, help provide some of the decentralized storage. So instead of one data centers, you've got thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands. And the blockchain keeps track of who's provided storage and keeps track of where files are stored. And again, there's this management oversight role that's not there anymore because every computer is automatically rewarded um, for the amount of storage they've provided and the amount of effort they've put into securing the blockchain or validating the, the public-private key crypto. 
And if you fail to do that, you don't get rewarded. So there's this incentive structure that makes all participants want to provide the good cloud storage and provide it honestly. And so you put money in and you'll get cloud storage out, even though there isn't a company in the middle, even though it's just a bunch of strangers on the internet running free and open source software. And so thinking about our token classification exercise again, we have these two continua. We have utility to investment is one continuum, and we have network to issuer or centralized company, as I've been referring to it, as another continuum. We can take these and we can put these on a graph if we like math, um, but it also gives us some geometry to understand the variety of tokens out there. So we'll put why is the token valuable on the y-axis, and in the bottom quadrants, we're going to say that the things in the bottom of the graph are useful. They're not so much investments. They're more useful items. And the things in the top of the graph are investments. And then we'll put on the x-axis what creates that value. On the left side of the graph, then, will be investments or utilities that are backed by a network, where it's just a group of people that create the value, kind of like globally the group of people interested in gold create the value of gold. And then on the other side, we'll put issuer, so more like a share of Apple stock, where we really rely on a centralized party to create the investment value, or the iPhones, if we're talking about utility. So now we can just start putting tokens where we think they belong on this graph. So here's where Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is more of a useful item than an investment, perhaps, because at the end of the day, what you get when you have a Bitcoin is the ability to send money through the Bitcoin network. It's kind of like PayPal. Now, of course, people buy it to hold it as an investment because they're assuming that people in the long term will be using Bitcoin to send money, which means Bitcoin being scarce, it will be in demand as a way of moving money uh, across borders or globally or paying for things or what have you. So maybe it's towards the investment side, but the idea is this fundamental thing exists as a way to make payments uh, on the internet. And then here's Ether. Ether is the scarce token that travels on and powers the Ethereum blockchain. And I've put it even further into the utility side of things, primarily because Ether isn't necessarily designed as a means of payment. It's designed as the fuel needed to run smart contracts on the Ethereum virtual machine, which of course needs a lot of unpacking, but we have other um, background materials to explain how Ethereum works and what it's useful for. But that's why it's down in this useful section. It's also maybe a little closer to the issuer section than the pure network side of the graph. And maybe that's because, as is often remarked by people who study the Ethereum community, there is a smaller and somewhat more cohesive group of developers. They don't all work for one corporation, but they're not nearly as decentralized as, say, Bitcoin's group of developers who are sort of spread to the four winds. But then here's the Ether presale token. So Ether was, was sold to people before there was a working Ethereum network. And in this case, I think at that point in time, we were talking about something in this lower right quadrant because it has less obvious utility. It's sort of a speculative guess that in the future it will be useful. And it's also something where we're relying on the person selling the token to ultimately develop that decentralized network, make it something functional. So we're really relying on the issuer to provide that functionality. Now, what's interesting about graphing it this way is then what we notice is that it moved, um, if we believe these characterizations. It went from something that was more of an investment to more of a useful item, and it went from something where we were relying on the issuer to back it up or to provide the value to something where the network now provides the value. When, when you run smart contracts on the Ethereum uh, virtual machine, it is the uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of computers connected to the Ethereum network that are providing that functionality, not just some issuer. And so we can also think about other tokens that might move. So, for example, Filecoin is the decentralized storage example I gave earlier, but that network isn't working right now. There's a group of people who want to build Filecoin, and they wanted to raise money to build Filecoin. So they sold 
a set number of the file coins that will ever exist on the network in advance, in a pre-sale, if you will, like the Ether pre-sale. But they rather transparently said, look, you're definitely relying on us to make this network valuable. We know we're the issuer. And we know most people are buying this now, not because they want to use the storage as soon as it's available on the network, because why wouldn't you just use Amazon now? So we know people are buying it for a speculative investment-like purpose. So we will sell it in this uh, legal instrument called the Simple Agreement for Future Tokens, and we'll say, yes, this is a security, actually, and we'll only sell it to accredited investors. But the idea is it's a simple agreement for future tokens. So once the Filecoin network is up and running and there are actual Filecoins rather than just promises for future Filecoins, at that point, the token that travels on that network is a utility. It's something that gives you access to storage. And the usefulness of that is backed up by the entire network of persons who've connected their computers to the Filecoin protocol. And so it moves again. And then up here is the DAO. And the DAO was obviously marketed and existed as an investment. It was a way of pooling money, um, Ether specifically, on the Ethereum network, and selectively choosing where to invest it in order to grow the pool and reward all the people who pooled their Ether. It was basically a decentralized venture capital fund. So definitely in the north part of our graph, now, I've put it halfway between network and issuer because it, it was originally understood as something where it really would be every individual uh, contributor to the DAO who would decide where to invest the money. But the SEC said, um, actually, there's a lot of reliance on centralized parties here. The SEC said this in their DAO report, which they released in the summer of 2017. They said that there are people who write the code that there are people who play this role called the curator within the DAO smart contract. And these people, we, we sufficiently rely on their managerial efforts that we're going to call the DAO a security and we're going to call those people promoters or issuers of a security. So the SEC very clearly said that the DAO does have a lot of that value backed up by the issuer rather than it being just a, a, a purely decentralized network. And we could put this over here, a tokenized venture capital fund, where, for example, there are general partners who make the investment decisions, and they're just known and identified people working for the fund. And then there are limited partners who get their share of the growth of the fund, and those limited partners are the token holders, the people who happen to have these tokens at any time. This is somewhat similar to what blockchain capital has devised. So in this world, we know we're relying on the general partners, uh, the issuer of the token, to create the value, and we know it's an investment, firmly in the upper right quadrant. And then there's a number of other tokens we can put on this graph. So we could imagine stable coins, um, where you know people buy it as a store of value long term, something that won't fluctuate. Um, so it's maybe kind of investment, maybe kind of utility too. It's closer to the currencies. Um, uh, part of the axis. Um, but it is a network, ideally, that creates the stability of that value. Now, this is speculative. I don't think anyone's built one that works yet, but that's why it's over here. And then we can imagine currency-like applications that are kind of investments, kind of for money transmission, that are really powered by issuers, where there's somebody backing the coin with gold, and that provides its value. Somebody has that gold somewhere, and we're trusting them to keep it. Or dollar-backed coins, um, like Tether, where someone's trusting someone to say, we have this much um, money on deposit at a bank that corresponds one-to-one -one with the number of coins in circulation. And then there's a couple of other things, like maybe somebody issues a token that gives you access to a concert, and maybe that's mostly the issuer backing it up, but maybe it could be more over here if it's really just like a federated group of artists or other people who provide the value of the concert ticket. Uh, or... Maybe people are pre-selling their marketing services or selling their marketing services, saying anybody who shows up with a token can get access to our services, where you're really relying on the company's marketing power uh, to provide the value of the token. But it's probably not an investment. It's more of something that provides this usefulness, this marketing uh, feature. 
Now, why, why else is it helpful to graph these things other than to start to understand, um, you know, why the token's valuable and what creates the value? Well, we can also add to this graph, you know, geometries of where we think there might be regulation. So this red area is one possible area where the SEC might have jurisdiction. It's as of yet underdetermined. As I said, the test for security basically asks two questions. Is it an investment, and are we relying on the managerial efforts of a third-party promoter? But it's a flexible test, so the SEC could choose to draw their jurisdiction this way. And Coin Center's hope is that the SEC draws their jurisdiction like this, um, that it really limits what it treats as securities to those things that are clearly investments and where we clearly rely on an issuer to create the value of that investment. And then taking away the presale tokens, dealing only with tokens that are running on functional networks now, we can draw some other boundaries. So this area, these are all centralized virtual currencies, at least according to FinCEN's uh, 2013 virtual currency guidance. And that means that the issuers of these asset-backed currencies are money services businesses. They need to register with FinCEN, do effective anti-money laundering, uh, compliance obligations, suspicious activity reporting, know your customer controls, things like that. And then this area in purple, well, these are cryptocurrencies. And because there is no real issuer of these things, there's just a network of miners and nodes, we don't ask for the issuer to do that MSB compliance. We say that any intermediary, so a custodial wallet provider or an exchange, those are MSBs when they offer exchange of, say, Bitcoin for Ether, and they need to register with FinCEN and do effective anti-money laundering compliance. And then this area, well, this is probably the FTC's jurisdiction, the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC is a consumer protective regulator that regulates often products. So if it's not an investment and if it's not a security, it's still a consumer product. And if you market it in a way that is deceptive or abusive, you could potentially be found uh, to violate some of the uh, regulations that the FTC has in place. You don't need to seek permission before you sell your token in these cases, but you would of course have to worry about how you market them and whether you've made the product safe. And how we draw all of these different lines is very important because there's a whole variety of tokens out there and obviously they can fall under different regulatory baskets. And that's why Coin Center has put in a lot of time and effort writing reports and thinking about the policy issues. We have a framework for securities regulation. We have a framework for consumer protection regulation. And we have a framework for anti-money laundering uh, and counterterrorism regulation with these technologies. So if you have any questions about these materials or questions related to open blockchain policy in general, please feel free to reach out to us at Coin Center.